Welcome to the PA Books podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. While the focus is always on Pennsylvania, topics like the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Industrial Revolution, the coal and steel industries, and authors like John Updike, David McCullough, and John Grogan have a universal appeal. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, Patrick Spiro, author of Frontier Country. Patrick Spiro, author of Frontier Country, The Politics of War in Early Pennsylvania. Why'd you write your book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think it was, uh, I, <laughs> that is a very long, the answer to that is very long and complicated, but at the core is um, archival research. Uh, while I was in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, I began discovering stories that I had never come across before in Pennsylvania's past, of Pennsylvania's past. And the more I dug, the more I realized there were some incredible stories that are not well known and that it was my job to try and tell them to a, to a wider audience. Well, what kind of things did you come across while you're doing this book that you had to tell people? You know, you run into somebody the next day and say, oh, did you know this about Pennsylvania? Sure. Uh, you know, I think the book is littered with stories that are like that. Um, the ones that I think get people's attention the most is the idea that Pennsylvania was essentially at war since 1730. Um, from 1730 to about the, through the American Revolution, Pennsylvania is in a constant state of war, which is very different from the way we think about Pennsylvania as this Quaker colony, as the pacifist colony, as a colony that was in an era of long peace because of its peaceful relations with Native Americans. And what I realized is that Pennsylvania was fighting wars against colonies. Um, they fought a war against Connecticut. They fought a war against Virginia. They fought a war against uh, uh, Maryland. When I tell people this, they say, what do you mean Pennsylvania was at war with their other colonies in the British Empire? This is, is this like the Civil War? This is totally new to them. Um, so th that's usually uh, the thing that I think gets people's uh, attention the most. Um, but then, of course, there are a bunch of little rebellions that I found throughout Pennsylvania's history in the 1760s during what we call the Imperial Crisis. And we're really familiar with a lot of the events that happened in the seaports in Philadelphia and Boston and New York, the Sons of Liberty, the Tea Parties, the Stamp Act protests. But what I found is that on the frontier of Pennsylvania, there are all these rebellions that are happening at the same time, but for very different reasons. Well, the, the uh, let's we could jump around and uh, spend the time just skipping from sure. There's a lot in there. Side, I know, but yeah. you, you mentioned Connecticut, mm -hmm. a border war with Connecticut, but Pennsylvania does not touch Connecticut. Yes, uh, this is uh, one of the things that happened in North America is the the charters. Every colony received a charter, and these charters that are drawn up in London, often in the 17th century, when these kind of imperial grand strategists have no idea about where things actually are. They're geographic. Uh, we, we have GIS today. We can pinpoint things there. They, they, they were getting longitude and latitude wrong. And so these charters were... Um, when they were sitting in London, kind of clear, but when they actually came, colonists came on the ground, there were all these disputes over where the boundaries were and where they weren't. And so Connecticut had this uh, charter that kind of said that they could go all the way to the, to, to the Western Ocean. And so New York then got in their way. And by the 1760s, Connecticut, which was their population had grown to a point where a lot of families were running out of land to give to their second sons and third sons. They started to reinterpret uh, their charter and say, hey, you know what? Sure, there's New York here, but after New York, all this Western land is, is Connecticut land. And so uh, in the 1750s, Connecticut um, uh, acquires uh, the land through a kind of shady deal with uh, some Native Americans that may not have had the right to sell the land. They then start to uh, send settlers out there and start to build counties. And Pennsylvania the whole time is saying, what are you doing? This is Pennsylvania land. So Connecticut settlers were considering themselves Connecticut residents. Were they paying taxes back to Connecticut? Uh, well, so at first, no. And in fact, it was uh, the 
It was an interesting um, a project. So Connecticut actually gave the rights to develop the land to something called the Susquehanna Company. It was kind of what we would think of as a private-public partnership today, where uh, a group of individuals um, uh, were given the land, and then they would resell the land to, to others. And then the, there would be a, a, a land tax, a property tax that individuals would pay. Um, but they would swear allegiance to Connecticut. And eventually, in the 1770s, Connecticut establishes official counties there with courts of law, all of which are operating under uh, Connecticut's jurisdiction and, and legal codes, not Pennsylvania's. What was the government of Pennsylvania at the time? Uh, Pennsylvania at the time was a proprietary government, which meant that it was the Penn family that uh, owned the rights to all uh, undeveloped land. Um, they had the right to appoint the governor, which was often a member of the Penn family. And the Pens also received uh, a quit rent, which is a tax the property owners paid back to the proprietors. And uh, the Pens were the ones that once Connecticut uh, started to settle, they had to marshal uh, militias and others to go out there and confront people from Connecticut. And that's where the war began to develop as people loyal to Connecticut uh, uh, confronted Pennsylvanians and forts were formed and pitch battles were fought, people died. People died to establish the border between Pennsylvania and Connecticut? Yes, and that's one of the, uh, you, you, actually when we were talking before the interview, just uh, you'd mentioned you're surprised that people died fighting for Connecticut or, or Pennsylvania, which I had not really thought very deeply about until you said that. Because to me, when I, the book chronicles kind of a, you know, 70 or 80 years of conflict in Pennsylvania, often armed conflict. And I think I'd become immune to the fact that people were willing to die for a colony uh, or in the name of a colony. Um, but when you said that, it actually made me think a little bit more about what that really meant, that individuals were so loyal to a colony that they were willing to take up arms, put their lives in danger, um, something that I don't think we would ever think about doing today um, when we think about states. And of course, there's competition between New Jersey and Pennsylvania. There's various you know, tax policies and codes, but we'd never think about you know, confronting New Jersey in an armed, armed confrontation and people willing to enlist to fight uh, New Jersey or Connecticut or New York. What did they think in England uh, about this? Right, so that's, that's one of the, uh, what I think, one of the things this reveals is the, the book has a lot of, uh, I hope very dramatic um, and compelling stories uh, like these conflicts in which individuals are staking their lives, decisions are being made. But the larger point uh, is that here's a British empire that is unable to manage its colonial holdings. Um, the, co the reason that colonies are going to war with each other, I think that's first off, that's a evidence of a failure of the British Empire that helps us understand the American Revolution. Again, trying to shift our focus away from the seaports, but into these western and frontier areas to show here's an empire that is trying to assert control over all these domains, and yet the colonies within it are fighting each other. And so the empire itself is uh, it, it's slow moving. Um, information is first off slow to arrive there, and then processing information takes uh, time, decision-making takes time, and then conveying those decisions back across the Atlantic takes even more time. And you often see those that are in charge of colonies, whether it's the Pens or it's the governors of Connecticut or Virginia, they actually don't want to take their complaints to the empire because they don't know how they're going to decide. You know, if, if Connecticut or if Pennsylvania can get rid of Connecticut through force of arms, then they'll know that they win. If they take it to the British Empire, the charters are actually confusing and contradictory. And might a British court decide for Connecticut over Pennsylvania because Connecticut received its charter before Pennsylvania and therefore supersedes Pennsylvania's claims and all these other things. So there is um, this is a, a, a evidence of the empire's kind of failure. So what did the Pennsylvania Charter actually say that when it defined the borders that was ambiguous? Right. Uh, and, and there's a kind of constant ambiguity about how to interpret Pennsylvania's uh, uh, charter. In my book, there's a great map that shows this is what Pennsylvania should look like if you have a literal reading of the charter. And it would be further north, uh, Philadelphia, 
technically, there's a strong argument that Philadelphia should be in Maryland. Uh, the western border should, uh, uh, there was an interpretation that said the western border should follow the exact outlines of the Delaware River. Um, and it goes north into, into New York. Um, so uh, the Pennsylvania Charter is uh, the Delaware River, and then it's the western uh, boundary is unclear, and the southern boundary and the northern boundary should be further, further north. So, so who won the shooting war between Pennsylvania and Connecticut? Well, uh, in the short term, Connecticut did. Uh, one of the things that I show in my book is that by the 1770s, many Pennsylvanians, especially those outside of Philadelphia, had really lost faith in the colony. And they began to side, they either, uh, you know, took part in these rebellions that challenged the, the colonial government and the imperial government, or in the case of Connecticut, they started to side with Connecticut. Uh, we, I have evidence of settlers in Lancaster County kind of streaming up the Susquehanna River to fight on behalf of Connecticut. And so you begin to see colonists beginning to lose faith in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania's government and instead siding with Connecticut. And therefore, Connecticut's able to, through force of arms, push back Pennsylvania. So by the American Revolution, you have in the north, uh, Westmoreland County of Connecticut operating. And it only becomes Pennsylvania through uh, one of the few successful acts of the Continental Congress. Uh, the Articles um, of uh, Confederation, they have a, a clause. It's interesting. It's the longest clause of the Articles, and it is how to uh, manage border disputes, because colonists knew how many there were and how problematic they were. And so this uh, clause says that there needs to be a court uh, held with justices, uh, a neutral body of justices, to hear the case, and that that body would adjudicate these border disputes. And so this conflict was taken to this court. It's one of the uh, only times it was called. It's one of the successful acts of uh, the uh, uh, Continental Congress, and uh, it decides on behalf of Pennsylvania. And so that's when it begins to become Pennsylvania again. Yeah, you, you describe a battle in there where Pennsylvania sent 700 troops and Connecticut had 250 and Pennsylvania lost? Right. No, I, I mean, uh, and Pennsylvania was trying to, throughout this, uh, really assert their uh, uh, authority. Uh, they were able to marshal um, their own uh, 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 militias. And what's interesting about Pennsylvania, which is different from Connecticut, is that that militia I was talking about was really under the command of the proprietor. What you had uh, in Pennsylvania was a, uh, the assembly or the legislature at the time uh, was generally unwilling to support the proprietor in a whole range of things. And so really the proprietor had to fund these militias, the Penn family uh, had to fund these militias out of their own back pocket. Were they Quakers at the time? No, they had converted so they to were not pacifists Anglican. Anymore. Exactly. And that's where one of the, there, there was a, a, a kind of strife between the assembly, which had uh, kind of a, a, were dominated by Quakers till the 1750s and then continued to have this, um, uh, many of the same values that the Quakers had continued to infuse the assembly and their thinking about policy and politics. And then you had the Penn family uh, who controlled all the land and also were tasked with uh, the title of Captain General, which meant that they were in charge of the militia. And so the assembly basically said, we don't want to support a militia. Militias mean that we're going to have wars. Uh, and it seems like the Penn family, the only thing you want to do, uh, this is what the assembly would say, is the only thing you want to do is purchase more land and the purchase of land leads to more wars, which leads to more uh, violence. And so we are not going to support a militia. That's on you to do that. And well, so the, the Penns had to fund it. Yeah. The Penns also lost money if if uh, Connecticut took some of their territory. No, exactly. Uh, the, the proprietor's uh, long-term financial interest were in expanding the colony. You really see that even from William Penn, who had many great idealistic visions for his colony, but he also had this underlying assumption that all of this land would one day be his, and that he hoped to do it through peaceful means and through cohabitation with Native Americans, but it would one day be his land and his heir's land. And so there's always this, uh, in William Penn's thinking, this kind of um, contradictory fusion between idealistic visions for a Quaker pacifist colony and a colony that is always going to be expanding. So this dispute between Pennsylvania and Connecticut was not settled until... 1782. 1782, yep, so Court six Trenton. years after the Declaration of Independence, while the war was, Revolutionary War was going on. Yep. You'd think they'd have bigger things on their mind than the border dispute between Pennsylvania and Connecticut if they had a Revolutionary War going on. 
No, absolutely. And uh, what, what's interesting is there's also a, a conflict going on in Virginia at the same time. So this is 1782. I think this is Congress after Battle of Yorktown. They're trying to really kind of establish that they're able to function as now a government. And so the Trenton uh, decision is really important, but it's short-lived because then we see what happens. The Congress is generally weak and ineffective until the, the Constitution. But you actually have this other case that's happening at the same time in the West over Pittsburgh, where you have Virginia asserting that Pittsburgh is actually Pennsylvania territory, and they too succeed and win. And what's interesting there is that during the American Revolution, Virginia and Pennsylvania entered an essentially a treaty to say, you know what, this is Pennsylvania land, we'll, and Virginia renounces their, uh, their uh, claims to it. But there was also something called Lord Dunsmore's War. Right. Was there shooting between Pennsylvania and Maryland? Uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia? Virginia uh, no. So, so uh, Dunmore's War uh, is relatively well known by historians, but it's often um, viewed as a war that Virginians fought between Shaw the Shawnees uh, over the Ohio River Valley. Uh, but what I show is that it actually its origins begin with a conflict between Virginia and Pennsylvania. So after the French and Indian War, Virginia claims that Fort Pitt and all that surrounding territory out there, which is so important to the future of North America. Whoever controls Fort Pitt and the, you know, the, the forks, uh, the three rivers that uh, uh, collide there in the, the Ohio, controls the future of North America. That's where all the trade is going to go. Which is why George Washington, young George Washington, went there and before the French and Indian Exactly. Uh, Washington owns a ton of land out there because he sees this is the future. And so after the French and Indian War, Virginia says, well, this is our land. Uh, and Pennsylvania, recognizing that, well, this is very valuable land that controls trade, it's our land too. And so you have Dunmore, uh, Lord Dunmore is the governor of uh, uh, Virginia. He goes out there. He has a number of uh, agents out there who start doling out militias, uh, 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 appointments and militias, free land, getting all these settlers to support Virginia. And Pennsylvania is out there saying, no, 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 this is our land. You should really support Pennsylvania too. And so you have this competition going on there. And once again, you see more settlers side with Virginia. I do have to read this part where you write about uh, both Virginia and Pennsylvania saw that having a colony in the Ohio Valley would enhance the possibility for peace by providing a safety valve for the worst of the people who will retreat to this new country, leaving the best who are the most consequence behind in Pennsylvania. So the worst people would go the, to Pittsburgh and leave the good people behind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this th that was one of the most revealing quotes uh, that I found in the sources. It actually kind of speaks to a larger theory about uh, American expansion, um, which is that the frontier served as a safety valve. That one of the reasons America uh, has been s relatively stable, especially in the 19th century, uh, when you compare it to European uh, urban revolutions and revolts. You know, we had a civil war over slavery, but we didn't have the same type of urban revolts that you saw in Europe. And there's this theory that the frontier served as a safety valve. And here you see in the 18th century, that quote was from, uh, I believe, John Penn, who's the governor of Pennsylvania at the time, basically saying that that was one of their theories for expansion, that the frontier could serve as a safety valve for the most lawless people while uh, the more established people uh, could could stay to the east. You have something in here, I don't know if I can find it, that talked about uh, how the, uh, oh, here, the, the, the Paxton boys, you talk about them, we can talk about them a little bit later. They were a more politically coherent and unified group whose actions were meant to display their strength to Philadelphia through a show of martial force and their ferocity of their murders and the size of their march was meant to show that a unified frontier people were more powerful than the government institutions like the jail in Lancaster they invaded. So even then they saw the the people on the frontier as having different values than the people in the city. No, and that's one of the uh, things that I, I discovered and that I try and argue in this book is that after the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, Pennsylvania really becomes a divided colony, and it's divided along geography. There's Philadelphia and the East, uh, and the story of Pennsylvania often is told from that perspective, and it's the story of the rising city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia begins as a small outpost in the 1680s. People are living in caves, but by 1776, Philadelphia is one of the largest uh, cities in the entire British Empire. It is successful. It is diverse, both economically and culturally. Um, 
But if you look to the West, there's a very different history of Pennsylvania. And if you think about Pennsylvania as a coherent colony and yet uh, in a history that you have to integrate both East and West, you see in the, in the West the disintegration of the colony. You have these rebellions like the Paxton Boys. You have a group of the Paxton Boys numbered several hundred who marched from Lancaster County to Philadelphia in the winter of 1764 to protest the Eastern policies and the Eastern elite. And you have this incredible divide developing within the colony. Well, how was the frontier being governed from Philadelphia or not governed? Right, and that's one of the, the um, big challenges to the government and one of the complaints of those that are living in the frontier. And that's that the uh, assembly uh, is heavily weighted towards the east, uh, that it has, I think, uh, by 1764, if my memory's right, uh, 26 uh, representatives from Philadelphia and the three original colony uh, counties and 10 from the frontier. So here you have a colony that's being governed almost exclusively by the east. And as the Paxton boys would point out, by 1765, the population is actually equally dispersed between the east and the West. And a historian has actually gone back and tried to uh, uh, estimate if it was based on, if representation was based on population, what it, the assembly would look like, and it would be a lot more equal. And so you have those in the West saying, we are being governed by this distant body that doesn't understand who we are, and we need a government that is more representative of the whole, which is an interesting way for this debate and discussion uh, for greater democracy to begin to emerge in Pennsylvania. From It's coming from the West, and their values and concerns are very different from those in the East. Are there times you were writing this book and saw that, that divide going on and thought that some, some lessons of the, this still apply today? Yes, no, absolutely. Uh, I took a number of trips out West to kind of understand these areas that I was uh, writing about. And you absolutely get a sense of this um, divide between Philadelphia and, say, people living in Fulton County or uh, in Mercersburg. Uh, that they, they see and feel themselves, uh, that they absolutely believe that they are Pennsylvanians, and they're quite proud of their history. Um, but they don't see themselves as Philadelphians, and there is a underlying tension between uh, urban and rural that I think still exists in, in Pennsylvania. It has its roots back in the 1720s? Absolutely. I, uh, I think you can see uh, um, the origins of this concern coming out of uh, particularly the French and Indian War, which is where I think that's, that's the moment that is transformative for the colony of Pennsylvania. Before the 1750, Pennsylvania is, is as, a, as a coherent colony, thriving and succeeding. They, they fight a war against Maryland, and they win. They lose the other wars in the 1770s. Why do they win in the 1730s? It's because all of the colonists in this area actually say, we'd rather be Pennsylvanian than Maryland. Pennsylvania is a peaceful, prosperous colony. It's stable. The French and Indian War happens, uh, and for the first time, the colony is not able to kind of respond adequately to those that are living in the West. They feel like their government is ignoring them. They feel like they're the front lines of a war and they're not getting the support and aid they need. And what you then see developing in the 1760s and beyond is the sense that the government in the East doesn't care about the West. Did they have a point there? Um, that's a hard one to answer uh, because I, one of the things is if you, if you really immerse yourself in the sources uh, and really understand what people are saying, their feelings, um, you would understand that those in the East want peace as much as those in the West do. Uh, but their means for accomplishing peace doesn't resonate with those in the West. So the Quakers uh, form a, a, the Friendly Association. All right, This is an independent, what we might think of as an NGO today, with the idea that they're going to go out and negotiate with Native American groups who are at war with Pennsylvania during the French and Indian War. Many of these groups had been allies of Pennsylvania beforehand. They see this as a diplomatic group that is going out there to establish peace. And that's what everybody wants. Now you have those on the frontier who see this group as a nefarious group. It's a group that is meant to trade with Indians so Quakers can enrich themselves. 
Um, it is a group that is going to supply Indians who are right now at war with them with trade goods that they're only going to use to now uh, to strengthen themselves to attack those in the frontier. And so what you see are, are two people that, have, that both want peace, uh, and they're not really communicating well with each other. That brings up the story of the black boys and the, the supply. Can you tell that story? Sure, the Black Boys are one of my uh, the favorite stories in, in this book, and in fact, I've now written a, an entire book on the Black Boys that is going to come out in a year. Um, so the Black Boys, so without ruining that future book, <laughs> uh, the, the Black Boys is a rebellion that happens in 1765. And if you think about that year, 1765, that's the Stamp Act. We often associate that with the foundation of the American Revolution. The origins of the revolution date to the debates that emerge with the Stamp Act and Parliament's attempt to tax the colonies. That's when the Sons of Liberty form. What also happens on the frontier is a peace treaty. Uh, there is a peace treaty that's going to happen at Fort Pitt that is going to bring Pontiac's war to a close. And a diplomat named George Krogan uh, it, it amasses one of the largest trading um, uh, uh, missions ever uh, uh, compiled in colonial American history. His goal is to have 30,000 British pounds, that's what one estimate puts it at, sent west to Fort Pitt, where he's going to hold this massive treaty to, again, bring peace to the frontiers. And the way he's going to bring peace is to show uh, the British sincerity through a overwhelming display of gift giving. Now, all the, a group on the frontier begin to say, well, we don't want to give Native Americans more trade goods because there's going to be another war. Um, and so they destroy this pack train of goods. They dress as Native Americans. They burn all the trade goods. They destroy what, if it's 30,000 British pounds, that's three times as much as the Tea Party. They then lay siege to a British fort twice. They seize the commandant prisoner. Uh, all in an attempt to assert their view on how the British Empire should manage it fr its frontiers. Um, and so this is happening at the same time as the Stamp Act, but it's on the frontiers. And it's not well known because most of the evidence exists in manuscripts. It's not in pamphlets like the Sons of Liberty produced, or it's not newspapers re reports recounting all the protests that happened in the seaports. It's in manuscripts. Why were they called the Black Boys? Uh, right. So uh, they call themselves the Black Boys because of uh, they dress as Native Americans and they use charcoal to disguise their faces. And so they were called the Black Boys. They also some of the times were called the Loyal Volunteers. And you say in your book that the, the uh, militia went in and captured some of them and, and uh, the capture of men in arms by the military seemed to frontier people to intrude on their rights. They refused to let such actions go unopposed. On March 9th, the group, now larger in number and well-armed, surrounded Fort Loudon to demand the return of the prisoners and guns. The commander of the fort acquiesced and released the prisoners rather than risk losing a, losing a great many innocent lives. He kept the seized arms, however, and this decision would only further embolden frontier settlers who saw the continued possession of their private property as a violation of their rights. Again, the frontier versus the city. Well, where did England fall on this? Right. Was so this the, coming from the Pens or the Quakers or England? Yeah, uh, so one of the uh, things I hope to show in this book is the kind of all the overlapping jurisdictions here. Um, that, there, that there's a lot that's unsettled about the frontier. Who governs the frontier? Who controls policy on the frontier? And that's what you're actually seeing in this, in that uh, quote you, ju you just read. Because here's a, an issue that is very much what people in the East are complaining about, property rights. But in the East, it's about taxation. It's about, uh, uh, you know, trade regulation. And here it is about actually the seizure of guns. Um, that you have a British army uh, going out, arresting individuals who may be, uh, have, who are probably involved in the Black Boys Rebellion, and not only seizing them, but also their private property. And then they released the, the men, but they continue to hold the private property. And this is the British military going out there. So this is a new assertion of the British Empire's role in the frontier. Up until this point, it's the civil authorities that arrest people. Uh, you, the British military doesn't according to the frontier sailors, doesn't have the right to arrest individuals. They don't, you know, British subjects, they don't have the right to seize property. Now, the British Empire is saying, well, you know, on these frontiers, we really need to maintain peace. And sometimes we have to take these type of measures in order to, you know, assert law and maintain order. And now the Pennsylvania government is the other piece that's in here. So you have frontier settlers, you have the British Empire, and you have the Pennsylvania government, uh, who is kind of 
the governor is unsure of what he's supposed to do. Because on the one hand, the governor is a uh, loyal to the crown in the British Empire. But at the same time, he has these colonists who he wants to make sure are loyal to Pennsylvania or they're going to go side with Virginia or Connecticut. And so you see the government actually uh, uh, really paralyzed, which only makes the situation on the frontiers deteriorate even further. The, the black boys, you say, were acquitted of all charges, which gave them free reign to keep on doing what they were doing? Yeah, again, and this kind of parallels what's happening in a lot of the seaports. So one of the things that happens in the seaports is the British Empire passes these uh, regulations on uh, trade goods, that they're going to be taxed or they're have an, an impost put on them, a tariff, and people smuggle. And juries of their peers acquit smugglers of this, saying that these laws are unjustified. So the same thing is happening now on the frontier. So the, those that are arrested, that are involved in the black boys, are, are, are tried uh, between uh, before a grand jury. The grand jury are all their peers, and the grand jury says they have done nothing wrong, which, again, gives them a legal uh, kind of veneer to, to, for their actions. And you say... Uh also in your book, the Black Boys Rebellion confirmed for many people that Pennsylvania's government was far too weak for the task the empire expected of it. Thomas Gage likewise wondered if the government of Pennsylvania can even be called a government. Well, how did the Pennsylvania's government at the time then compare to Maryland, Connecticut, Virginia? Sure, and this is something that Ben Franklin is out in front of uh, advocating that, in, that Pennsylvania's mode of governance, which is, again, a proprietary government, which means the Penn families are in charge of the governorship. That is an antiquated model. It's from the 17th century, he says. All the other British colonies, or most of the other British colonies, are royal colonies, which means that the governor serves at the pleasure of the king and is firmly loyal to crown policies. And what you get with the proprietorship, Franklin says, is this person who is loyal to no one but themselves. And as a result, the government is ineffective. It is not able to maintain its order. And you do see that in the Black Boys Rebellion, where you have John Penn, who's the governor, kind of, uh, rather than asserting government authority, almost um, being at best neutral and maybe in some ways supportive of the black boys because, again, he's afraid that if, the, if he's too uh, uh, you know, strong with the black boys, he's going to lose the loyalty of these settlers who may go side with Virginia or Connecticut. Well, um, we, we could talk about this for a long time, but we haven't really touched much on the, uh, the war with Maryland. And it's, uh, I have always read it as Cressop's War, and you have in here a, a Cono Jocular War. Yeah. What does that name mean? Sure. I, I had a long debate myself over what to call the war. Um, so, and, and this isn't in the book, but there's an interesting um, way this war is described. So, from 1730 to about 1738, Pennsylvania and Maryland are involved in a border conflict. Uh, again, militias are formed. Um, there are pitched battles. A few men die. And Pennsylvania historians, especially in the 19th century, have always called it Cressap's War. And it's called Cressap's War because Thomas Cressap is the leader of the Marylanders. He's appointed by Lord Baltimore. He sets up a house right at the almost right at the 41st parallel, which is where Maryland says their colony should start. Where is that? It's in, in, north of Philadelphia. Hmm. Um, so essentially, uh, in, in one of the great stories is uh, eventually Pennsylvania is able to capture Thomas Cressap. He's arrested. He's brought to a jail in Lancaster, and they say we. We don't feel like he's safe here. Marylanders are going to invade the jail and rescue Cressap. We need to bring him to Philadelphia. So Cressap is being brought into Philadelphia, and the streets are lined with Philadelphians uh, heckling him or harassing him. And Cressap, and this is in the records, you know, there's a, a, an account of it. He turns to his uh, jailer, uh, uh, and he says, um, Damn it, Aston, uh, this is the prettiest town in Maryland. <laughs> referring to Philadelphia. Yes, because technically <laughs> Philadelphia, if you read the, the literal charter of Maryland, uh, should be in uh, Maryland. Uh, so anyways, uh, I've, now got, I've gone on a digression from your question. Conajocular War. Why is it called the Conajocular War? So Pennsylvanians have always called it Cressap's War because they say this is an offensive action by Marylanders and by Thomas Cressap in particular. Now, Marylanders have written about this war as well, and they always call it the Conajocular War. 
And they call it that because that's the, this region of the Susquehanna Valley. The Native Americans also often called it the Conajohali, uh, which has been kind of conajocular. It's been morphed into conajocular. Um, it's, it's how Native Americans describe this, this area of, um, of the area. Many people at the time called it the conajocular war. Um, it's only later, as historians began to interpret it, that Pennsylvania historians called it Cressap's War. And I wanted to call it something more neutral because really, it's unclear. If you look at the literal record of the charters, whose territory this should be. And to say that it's Cressap's War is again to almost affirm that yes, this was Pennsylvania land. It restores, I hope, some of the contingency to, to this conflict. I have to read something else from your book. I have a lot of things marked here. Uh, Cressap, uh, built a homestead and a, a clear sign to Pennsylvania neighbors that he would not be so easily cowed. Friends and family members joined him, people of, quote, loose morals and turbulent spirits, according to uh, one Pennsylvanian. Soon Maryland had a bustling and tight-knit com knit community on the contested West Bank situated just north of Lancaster. So that's pretty far north, and they were of loose morals and turbulent spirits. How many Marylanders actually uh, lived above the uh, what's now the border? Yeah, that's hard to tell, um, but definitely uh, more than 200, probably, if you include women and children. Um, uh, that quote comes from uh, Samuel Blunston, who is the leader of the Pennsylvania side. And what, what you see happening is, again, there's a competition for how many settlers can you get in this region? Because one of the theories is the more people you have loyal to you, the better your chances are of first off defeating Pennsylvania and also if it goes to the British Empire, to that court, the fact that you have more settlers loyal to you, that would be evidence that this should be your territory to a court if it gets adjudicated by the British Empire. And so what Maryland does is they basically say, we want to accept everybody into our colony. So they go down to the boats that are arriving from Ireland and take all the settlers and say, we'll give you free land if you come out and swear allegiance to Maryland. Uh, they, there's a number of women who are very involved and are loyal to Maryland precisely because Maryland says they're widows. And they say, we'll recognize your land if you come and you bring your children and you defend your, your land. One of the leaders of a Maryland militia is somebody named Betty Lowe, whose husband is arrested by Pennsylvanians and held, but she is, uh, be, then she takes up arms and becomes a strident advocate for, for Maryland. And so that's what Blunt is talking about. It's the fact that Maryland is just accepting everybody into their colony. So there was shooting actually going on? Oh yes, yeah, no, there's uh, Cressap's house becomes a fort. Um, there are a couple of attempted raids on it uh, and, and, uh, and at least one in, uh, uh, person is killed in one of these raids. Several people are injured, um, arrests happen all the time. So, You say in your book that Pennsylvania lost the war with Connecticut and Virginia but won the one with Maryland. How did it win the one with Maryland? Uh, that is uh, be because what ends up happening is uh, two things happen. The first is many people who are these new settlers over time uh, begin to say, you know what, Pennsylvania is the better government. We prefer to be under Pennsylvania. There's actually a group of Germans that are uh, really turn the tide. Um, they have arrived. They settle on the west side because they don't think there's any land in Pennsylvania. They see Maryland. They see the way Cressap is acting. Cressap is very, uh, he has a reputation of being very authoritarian. Um, and so they eventually, in 1736, say, you know what, we renounce our allegiance to Maryland, we're going to side with Pennsylvania. And that's really a turning point in, in the whole conflict uh, that gives uh, Pennsylvania a new leg up in the eyes of the British court if it goes there, because they now have this new group that, that has uh, sided with them. The other thing that happens is uh, Pennsylvania realizes that if they get Native American um, uh, uh, if they, they purchase the land from Native Americans, then they'll have additional evidence in a court of law in the British Empire. And this is a really complicated uh, decision for Pennsylvania because on the one hand, Pennsylvania has long prided itself on its uh, peaceful relations with Native American groups. It's also recognized the rights of the groups living in the Susquehanna Valley, especially the Conestoga, but also the uh, Shawnees, the rights to this land. Now, at the same time, there's the Six Nations Iroquois uh, who claim that they actually own this land. And so there's all these competing interests throughout my book that, that, that are going on. And so what Pennsylvania decides to do is purchase the land from the Iroquois. And they do so because they realize that the British Empire 
thinks more highly of the Iroquois uh, in their claims than they do of the Conestoga. And so they enter into a, 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 an agreement with the Iroquois to purchase this land. Now, that, of course, upsets the Shawnees and the Conestogans and others who claim that, well, you can't sell this without our permission, too. Well, you say that the, the, one of the reasons for the walking purchase, and we've talked about the walking purchase on this program before, one of the reasons for that is to prevent New York from coming in and claiming it. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's one of the things I hope the book um, shows is how important competition between colonies was to decision making, especially with regards to expansion. And the walking purchase, 1737, so it's happening in the midst of this war that Pennsylvania has been fighting now for six years against Maryland, a costly war that is costing the proprietors. They're funding this whole thing themselves. And so there are New Yorkers that begin to start to say, well, you know, this area of uh, Pennsylvania should be ours, too. And so they, Pennsylvania quickly says, you know what, we need to nip this in the bud because we can't fight another war with, with New York. So as part of the... the conflict with uh, Maryland, there's uh, Delaware. Was Delaware involved in the discussions there? Because it was supposed to be part of Pennsylvania. Yes, and that, uh, that does not manifest itself in the same way that the west side of the Susquehanna does. But there is a dispute over who controls Delaware. And that has to do with um, a, it's a very arcane legal uh, uh, kind of way of, of colonization. And so Maryland, if Delaware was settled by Europeans uh, first, in the set before England got the territory, it should be Delaware's. And so there's a long running debate over whether or not the Swedes had actually uh, settled Delaware or not. But what's interesting to me and why my book focuses on the West is the Delaware conflict never becomes the same war as what happens with Cressap's War, Con Jocular War. And the reason why is because it has to do with the same reason that Virginia and Pennsylvania fight over Fort Pitt. Everybody knows that the most valuable land is west of the Susquehanna. That's the most fertile farmland. And Lord Baltimore uh, actually travels to his colony in 1732. And at this point, he's considered giving up this claim because he thinks, as well, you know, maybe it's not valuable. And all of a sudden, he realizes how valuable it is. And he, that's when he begins to start to uh, actively and with arms confront Pennsylvania's claim. And so the reason that Delaware doesn't develop in the same way as the west of Susquehanna is, is because everybody sees the value of that land. Why didn't William Penn stay in Pennsylvania? Why didn't he just come for a short time and then go back to England? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion over that. Penn, Penn often talks about uh, his desire to retire to Pennsylvania. And actually, I, in some ways, I, I think of it in the same way as George Washington and Mount Vernon. So Washington from 17, say 75, when he's appointed, uh, 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 you know, uh, commander of the Continental Army, goes to Cambridge until 1783. He spends virtually no time at Mount Vernon. And then as, during his presidency, he spends virtually no time in Mount Vernon. But he's always imagining Mount Vernon. It's this place that is perfect. It's his, his, it's his escape from the trials and tribulations of war and the presidency. And so for William Penn, Pennsylvania serves that same purpose. He is in England uh, the vast majority of his time because he has to defend Pennsylvania. He has to lobby for it. He, he, in order for Pennsylvania to succeed, he has to be in England. And he's always imagining the peace of Pennsylvania and his desire to reti retire there. Um, but he can't because in order for Pennsylvania to succeed, he has to be in England. He has to be lobbying the crown. He has to be fighting for the rights of Pennsylvania against people like the Baltimores who are trying to claim uh, the land. Lord Baltimore was back in England also? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. in this earlier period. Yeah. yeah. What do you do when you're not writing books? Uh, I am the librarian of the American Philosophical Society. Um, which is uh, one of the oldest institutions in Philadelphia. Um, it is an incredible uh, organization. It was founded in 1743 by Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Franklin founded it to advance uh, scholarship. Uh, to Its uh, mission is to promote useful knowledge. Um, and today uh, it functions uh, as uh, one of the uh, oldest uh, learned societies in the world. It's the oldest learned society in America. And it has a research library, which is what I oversee. It has over 13 
million pages of manuscripts that take up 2.5 miles of shelf space. Uh, we have over 200,000 rare books. Uh, we are the stewards of Benjamin Franklin's papers. They are in our vault, the journals of Lewis and Clark, uh, but we're also continuing to collect. So we have one of the largest collections of ethnographic and linguistic material in the world. And we also have uh, the papers of seven Nobel laureates in our uh, vaults, and we're continuing to acquire new, new collections all the time. Is it open to the public? Yes, it is. Uh, anybody that wants to conduct research um, is free to use our reading room. Uh, we have over 1,600 reader days a year. Uh, we also host a number of uh, public lectures. Uh, we have a uh, book series. Um, uh, we also uh, host conferences and offer fellowships for uh, kind of advanced researchers. How do people get to be members? Um, so APS has something called uh, members, uh, and there are about 850 uh, members in the United States and about 1,000 total in, in the world. And this is, uh, membership is given to those who are distinguished for their contributions to the advancement of knowledge, our mission. Um, and this cuts across disciplines. They can be artists, uh, they can be musicians, they can be scientists, they can be historians. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma is a member of the APS. 100 Nobel laureates are a member of the APS. And you don't even know that you're up for membership. What happens is you receive a letter in the mail and say, welcome to the APS, you've been elected a member. You have meetings where members sit yes, around and yep. say twice a year. Things. Exactly, uh, twice twice a year we host uh, meetings. Uh, one it's in April and once in November, and this again cuts across disciplines. It really reflects the APS's uh, mission to advance knowledge in whatever field that is. And so these meetings uh, have about 400 uh, members and guests uh, come, and he to hear the cutting edge research in a wide variety of fields. So we could have, for instance, a leading uh, Shakespearean come and uh, give a uh, one person uh, monologue. We could have a pianist come and perform a, a work and the next session could be on the latest immuno immunotherapy and cancer, and the next session after that is on the Civil War. Um, again, it's a very interdisciplinary meeting, very eclectic. I want to ask you about something in your book. You uh, Now, there are, often there are emails sent out with quotes, uh, about pithy quotes attributed to somebody, and this is one that sometimes attributed to Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or Benjamin Franklin or Woodrow Wilson. Or and you say that in 1755, the Pennsylvania Assembly delivered a message to the governor that said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. So is that the origin of that quote? Yes, it's, it's often attributed to Benjamin Franklin uh, and is likely that he was involved in its author, authorship. Um, but it was in an, uh, and it was reproduced in uh, pamphlets in various different formats. But the first time that I found it is actually um, in one of those debates between the assembly and the governor over whether or not there should be a militia law. And basically the, the governor is trying to um, push through a militia law that would give him control over the militia. And the assembly is saying, this is exactly one of the things we fear about a proprietary government. If the governor controls the militia and the governor is controlled by the Penn family and not the crown, all it's going to do is in, uh, advance the interest of the Penn family. And so we'd be giving up you know, a lot of our liberty by giving this family the right to control a militia. Oh, you say in, in the book about uh, establishing of counties on the frontier. How is that seen as part of kind of civilizing the counties or bringing order to them? Yeah. The, the frontier, I mean. Yes, yeah. So one of the things that you see happen is um, the first county that's created after the original ones is Lancaster County. And it's in uh, 1729. And the reason why is because uh, the government realizes that they need courts and law close to where the new settlements are. If uh, settlers have to travel all the way to Chester in the 1720s when the roads are poor, travel is difficult and dangerous, that actually the enforcement of law is a challenge. And so creating counties allows them to bring government to these areas and to better establish law and order. And what you then see happening is after the French and Indian War, there are counties created, but they're large counties. The process is slow. Um, so there's a kind of a, a pause there, which is at the same time that law and order disintegrates, as I show in my book. So after the American Revolution, the new state government is much more active in creating 
counties, precisely because they see that as a way of establishing law and establishing the kind of powers of government that need to happen in this state. We said earlier that Virginia had established some counties in what's now southwestern Pennsylvania. We, you, you also said, which I read earlier, about how Pennsylvania lost its war with Connecticut and Virginia. How did it lose its war with Virginia? Yeah, uh, so what happens is uh, after Dunmore goes out there and asserts Virginia's uh, um, control, there's this great, there's a, uh, Pennsylvania sends out somebody named Arthur St. Clair, and there are, both of these colonies are competing, and more people side with Virginia. But then Virginia launches a war against the Shawnees, which just convinces all of these colonists that, yes, Virginia is the colony we want to side with because they see Indians as enemies. Pennsylvania sees Indians as potential trading partners. And you actually see this divide between those on the frontier who see Indians through what I say is a much more racialized lens. They see Indians as inherent enemies uh, who they cannot trust and that they want war with. And you have Pennsylvania taking a much more benevolent approach, saying Indians can be allies, they can be trading partners, and with peace comes prosperity. And there's this divide that's happening on the frontier. Virginia is, what I argue, embraces the ideas of the frontier people, like the Paxton boys and the black boys. Well, you said uh, here, um, oh, unlike it's the earlier war with Maryland, which Pennsylvania won, Pennsylvania lost these two conflicts in large part because victorious colonies of Connecticut and Virginia, Virginia successfully appealed to the values of frontier people, while Pennsylvania offered a less persuasive vision for expansion, security, and Indian relations. So, and yet the, those parts of the state ended up in Pennsylvania. Right. So after the revolution, uh, there was this push to uh, basically stop the border disputes. Uh, so Thomas Jefferson's involved actually in uh, 1776 after writing the Declaration of Independence. He says, you know, this border conflict, this is a moment of union. We should just get along. The other thing that happens is Pennsylvania goes through a fundamental transformation uh, for the worst, I would say, in which these frontier values um, become integrated into government policy. And so during the American Revolution, you have Virginia now saying, we do not want war with Native Americans. We want to focus on beating the British. And we can't fight a second war. We don't want to fight a second war. It's Patrick Henry, who's the governor, and I document this in the book, who's saying, stop. Pennsylvania, its assembly, all of a sudden, uh, is now has a majority from the West in its legislature. And they start saying, no, we want to fight offensive wars against Native Americans. And they start encouraging it. And so you see a transformation happening on the frontier. And what I uh, conclude is that this transformation is actually something that eventually happens writ large in the nation as a whole. And that's where the title of this book comes from. It becomes a frontier country, America. And you can see that happening with Pennsylvania's own transformation in 1776 from, com from uh, having these kind of more uh, uh, Quaker traditional values of peace and trade and prosperity through peace and trade and cohabitation to one of, you know, warfare and expansion through offensive measures. Was that going on, the fighting against the Native Americans while the Revolutionary War was going on? Yes, and that's exactly where the, the, uh, Pennsylvania begins to reclaim settlers. You have people that had been loyal to Virginia all of a sudden saying, nope, we're Pennsylvania now, and we're Pennsylvania because they're sending us arms and ammunition and allowing us to take offensive actions against Native Americans. Was, was there at some point Pennsylvania government policy to just get rid of the Indians, like move them out of the state? Uh, never explicit. Um, that was never an explicit policy, but it was kind of a de facto one uh, during the Amer American Revolution. We talked a little bit about the Paxton Boys, but can you tell the, the story of who were they and where were they from and what they do? Sure. Uh, the, the Paxton Boys is actually, uh, when, when you asked how I started, decided to write this book, the Paxton Boys were my entry into this story, into my book. Um, what happened was I was going through the papers of Benjamin Franklin, and I came across this pamphlet he wrote in 1764 called uh, uh, The Narrative of the Late Massacres, and it recounts this brutal massacre that happened in Lancaster County in which a group of frontiersmen formed a militia that were eventually called the Paxton Boys and massacred the Conestoga Indians, essentially exterminated the tribe. And Franklin writes this pamphlet about it, and I had never encountered this story before, and that's where I started digging. Uh, and so what happens with the Paxton Boys is after they... Um, uh, assault these Conestoga uh, groups who had been allies of the of the colony. 
They then decide to march to Philadelphia to protest government policies towards Native Americans, and they're the advocates for removal. They say explicitly, we do not have, we should not have any Native Americans within our polity. It's dangerous because they're inherent enemies. They must be removed or killed. <laughs> um, and so they march to Philadelphia, and Philadelphians are up in arms. They're fearful that the Paxson boys are planning to assault Philadelphia, to invade Philadelphia, and overthrow the government. It's fear that this is a civil war. And so all of a sudden, militias form in the streets of Philadelphia. They barricade the cities. They tear down all the bridges on the Schuylkill River to stop the Paxton boys from entering Philadelphia. So the Paxton boys are forced to go up north and uh, settle in kind of Germantown, Chestnut Hill area. They stop at Coleman's Tavern. And uh, then P Benjamin Franklin uh, goes out to confront them to say, what are you guys thinking, you know? And it turns into um, they, re they return uh, to their homes, but not before they themselves pen their own kind of protest document document that is published. And then that turns into the Paxton Boys Rebellion turns into this massive pamphlet war where people are arguing in defense of the Paxton Boys and in defense of Pennsylvania's government. And it really, this really begins what I call the imperial crisis on the Pennsylvania frontier. The Paxton Boys is this moment in which colonists are beginning to assert themselves and you begin to see this divide between East and West, a divide that really challenges both the colonial government and the imperial government. And it really doesn't, uh, isn't resolved into the American Revolution. Did the, the Pennsylvania have a militia that confronted the Paxton boys, or did they not have? So they had British troops in uh, Philadelphia, many of whom are prepared uh, to, to fight, but they are not actively uh, uh, um, uh, kind of ready to confront the Paxton boys. So British troops and not Pennsylvania well, no, uh, troops. They, they stay in their forts, but they are, they're, prepa they're preparing mm -hmm. for the potentiality. Mm -hmm. But there are Philadelphians who take up arms. There are Germans who take up arms. There are reported to be Quakers who decide to take up arms uh, during this, which then becomes a, a kind of a uh, controversy with the Paxton boys, the fact that pa Quakers uh, are taking up arms, even though they say they're pacifists and stuff. It's unclear uh, if, if Quakers do, but the Quaker, I mean, everybody in Philadelphia is fearful. Did this shift in Pennsylvania policy more favoring the people on the frontier? Was that uh, people in the Pennsylvania government changed their minds, or would, did different people come in and get involved with the government? No, it, was, it was a transformation in the composition of the government. Uh, so before the American Revolution, again, the frontier is underrepresented in the legislature. One of the things revolution, the uh, people in charge of the revolution do is they begin to see the traditional elite, governing elite, as... Um, uh, you know, kind of the enemies of the revolution. And so they want to really eviscerate any of their power. So they give the legislature, uh, you know, the rep frontier representation in the legislature that's equal to their population. And in fact, it's equal representation per county. So I believe the representation is two to one frontier counties to eastern counties. And so that's where this origin of the, of the change in the policy comes also through this more democratic revolution. So it's one of the ironies of democracy, that it becomes more democratic, and yet at the same time it becomes more violent, and uh, the kind of racialized views of Native Americans become more ingrained into government policy. When did the Penn family finally lose control over Pennsylvania? In 1776, um, they are uh, uh, essentially, um, the government is taken over. Uh, they, there's a new um, uh, government. There's something called the Supreme Executive Council that functions as a quasi-governorship. Uh, now, what's interesting about the Pens is that they stay around, and they are actually not that disliked. Um, and it becomes so much so that John Penn eventually returns to the colony after the American Revolution. He lives in Philadelphia. The uh, government of colony uh, of, of Pennsylvania gives the uh, Penn family, they kind of reimburse them for lost land. Penn is buried uh, in a uh, ceremony at Christ Church, and leaders of the Revolution are pallbearers in his funeral. So the, the Penns, um, they lose their land, but they are compensated, which is really revealing since a lot of loyalists are not compensated, and they are treated well. What side of the revolution were the Pens on? Well, uh, well they were loyalists um, in theory, uh, but you could, in some of John Penn's uh, correspondence, he's also sympathetic to some of the uh, complaints against, against the crown. Well, we are out of time. We've been speaking with Patrick Spiro. He is the author of this book, Frontier Country, The Politics of War in Early Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. We'd like to hear from you. 
Our email address is pabooks at pcntv.com. Like us on Facebook to learn more about PA Books.